morning everybody welcome to worship at Burniston um, and hope you're all well in your own homes and we're thankful that we're drawn together by God's Holy Spirit so let's pray Lord thank you for this time please draw us together by your Holy Spirit we ask for your blessing over our service today we thank you for your great love for us and although, Lord, we can't worship you in song, we want to proclaim you as the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Amen. Well, another week has gone by and um, I'm wondering how you're all feeling. In our church WhatsApp groups and prayer groups, the people have been really honest about their feelings about feeling overwhelmed, weary, tired, emotional, grief stricken, worried, anxious. How are you feeling? So at these times we could be asking God, where are you? Why am I feeling so bad? Why is this happening? The Psalms are full of David and others crying out to God and asking these very questions. Bruce is going to be talking later on about and focusing on God's loving response to our feelings of weariness and burdens. So I look forward to that. One thing that we can be assured of is that God loves us and he draws us close to himself and Jesus weeps with us. He is the, that man of sorrows. He knows pain and grief and he is close to us during these strange and terrible times. Let's lean into him for comfort and peace. And let's focus on his promises.
Thank you, Lord, for your great promises. Enjoy the rest of the service, everybody. Bye. God bless. This morning's reading is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me for all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Hello everybody. It's great to be with you this morning, and that we can still be together in this way, even in this time of separation. I'm going to be bringing you our craft activity today, which is making some origami sheep, because we're doing about how the Lord is our shepherd. And this might be a lit little tricky for the smaller fingers, so if the grown-ups would like to help out, and hopefully we'll get an end product that the whole family can enjoy together. I'm just going to turn you around so you can see my fingers. And what you're going to need is one square sheet of paper. I didn't have any square sheets, so this is one I've made from a piece of A4 paper simply by folding one corner down and then ripping alongside it. Um, so what you're going to want to do is take this corner on the left hand side, fold it in about a quarter of the way and get a good fold there. Every time I do a fold, I'll just crease it over with a fingernail to make sure it stays in place. And then flip the whole thing over so the other side is facing you. And take the top corner, fold it down to the centre. Crease there. Take the bottom corner and fold it up so they meet in the middle. And crease there. And you're going to want to take this side here. Fold it inwards so that it meets the center line, like so. And take the other side on the bottom, and make it symmetrical, or thereabouts at least. After that, you take this corner that you just folded down and fold it back up just a little bit less so that it's in line with this line here and do the same with the bottom side and then after that you're going to want to take this corner and fold just a little line along it because these are the legs of your sheep so we're just adding some stability so that hopefully it'll be able to stand up once we're finished then after you finish those, you fold the entire thing in half along the horizontal line. And then, and this is a little tricky, you're going to want to take this corner on the left hand side and push it so that this diamond comes to the front. And this is the face of your sheep. What you can do is take this corner on the top of his face and fold it down to give him a little fringe, which is a nice detail for if you're adding decoration later. And then fold his face the same on the other side. And then you can angle it to however you'd like them to be looking. But just for now, fold him over into the center because you need to finish this leg on this side, so what you take this corner and fold it down so it's about level with this foot here. But it doesn't matter if they're not completely level because the sheep is much heavier 
on the front side and the back side so it's okay to have this back leg a little bit shorter and then open it out to the middle and push this diamond on the inside so that the legs are like so and finally fold over on the back side so his rear end doesn't open up when you try to stand him up and hopefully there you should have one completed sheep and if you're happy with that and you fancy being more adventurous you can maybe make a whole flock for your entire family. Verse 5 in Psalm 23 talks about how God fills our cups to overflowing so we're going to do a little activity thinking about all of the things that we need in life that God gives us and all of the things that we are so grateful to have especially in this time of coronavirus we've been thinking about all of the things that not just we can depend on God that we need to have that he has given to us but more than that Let's see what happens. So first of all, we're going to think about things that we need. We've estimated that about up to here on the cup is the amount of things that people need in life to survive. Now, a lot of people won't have these things. A lot of people around the world will have a lot less than us. But we've thought, what do we have right now in Burniston at home these times of coronavirus? Let's go, boys. What things does God give us? that we need to have. He gives us shelter, sun, so we have a place to live. He gives us oxygen so we can survive. He gives us food so we can eat. He gives us drinks. He, he gives us family so, so people can care for us. Anything else he, that we might need? Um, How about staying warm. Warm. Some things that help us keep warm are something we wear. Clothes. Clothes. Oh, yeah. we, we need clothes to put on. Can you think of more things? Beds. Beds to sleep mm -hmm. on. That's a good one. Keep us cosy at night. We need to have exercise to keep us going. Well done. That's a good one. We need floors. Floors, okay. So we've got something to stand on, some foundations, hey? Yeah. We need all of these things, okay, we're getting there. Mm. Anything else that we have? What about mm. the people around us? Do we need... Do we need friends? Friends! For relationships? We need friends. We need holidays. <laughs> Not everybody needs holidays, but they're a good thing that we are lucky enough to have. How about if we get poorly? We need doctors. We need police. Okay. We need looks, NHS. Looks like we're getting... We need a professor. We've got everything that we need that God has given to us. Now, how about... Is there anything else in our lives? Your life, your life, my life. What is in our lives that we don't need, but we like, and that we're, we've got... Football. Pop it in. Football. Xbox. Xbox. Cricket. Liverpool and Chelsea. Tobias. Wi-Fi. TV. Books? Yeah, books? Books. How about music? Music, yeah. Music. I'm school. Schooling, yeah. And school staying in touch with us so that we can get work from them to keep us busy and smiling. How can you put some things in for me? Yeah. How about gin and tonic? <laughs> I was thinking Zoom so that I can contact people and do my Bible study online. Bible study. Keep going. 
baths. Bath showers. Showers. Keeping clean. Okay. Perfume to smell nice. Perfume. Hay bales. Hay bales. Jewelry. Church. Church. Gardens. My friends just popped me around a beautiful bunch of tulips, so I have the flowers. Tulips. Oh, it's getting a bit difficult Grand to hold. Granddad. Grand Grandma. Oh, the cup's running over. Hornby trains. Good one. Hornby trains. Keep going. Really Are there any other things that you like? Lego. Minecraft, Nanny, Angry Birds, Grandad. So the bowl has still got water in. The cup is running over. I think it might be safe to say that even though Psalm 23 was written so long ago in Bible times, the same is still true for us today. God has given us so much that our cup is running over. A bit like this. <laughs> Hello. It's Great to be with you this Sunday morning. I'm actually recording uh, on the previous Monday at the moment because I'm going to do Psalm 23 and I'm going to take each uh, verse one day at a time for myself. And I reckon they may come out in such a way as that you might like to take each one yourself on a day to day basis. But it will come out as one package on the day, I think. But anyway, we're going to start with, as a very popular psalm, Psalm 23, uh, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd and um, I have everything I need. And when we look at uh, this uh, verse, uh, we see it says the Lord is my shepherd. And it reminds me of a long, long time ago when I first came to Burniston. I was a, a gardener. I was uh, employed by the church to uh, be a youth worker, but I had to supplement uh, my income. And so I had a little local job doing people's gardens. And sometimes I was just the gardener, but other times uh, I had a more personal relationship with the people and uh, it was Bruce and I would go into the home and have a cup of coffee, etc. I do remember many nice times around uh, the, the table with Suzanne and Paul Robinson having a cup of coffee. Uh, and they would pay me, but I would spend quite a high proportion of the time chatting over a cup of coffee. And it was just wonderful memories. Now, in a sense, uh, how this relates to the Lord is my shepherd is that, you know, he doesn't want to just be the shepherd. Um, if the psalm, for instance, was couched in this way, the Lord is the shepherd of Israel. It wouldn't be half as popular today because it, it, isn't, it wouldn't have been as personal. It wouldn't be as much comfort in funerals, for instance, when it is often used, because there is that lack of uh, per, uh, 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 intimacy. And so the Lord is my shepherd. He doesn't just want to be the shepherd. Uh, and um, he doesn't just want, in a sense, we all have uh, a, a connection with God, otherwise we wouldn't be alive. Uh, you know, all things are created by God, but also all things are sustained by his love and held together by love. And so, you know, we're breathing God's love and God's goodness, irrespective as whether, whether you know, we have personal uh, relationship. But he does want that personal access to our lives. He doesn't want to just look after the peripheral things of our lives, but he wants to come, as it were, into our home. He wants to sit with us. He wants to be with us. And we often say he wants to come into our hearts, which is the place of love. It's the place that's central to our decision making, central to our wills, and just central to our lives. And he wants to be right there in the centre. 
And so that first thing is, is the Lord my shepherd? Can you say that? I can remember when, well over 40 years ago now, when I asked Jesus into my life, I asked him into my heart. I said the words, was I sincere? I'm not sure that I was when I look back. I think I was just trying to get the evangelist off my back, to be honest, the young man that was trying to convert me. And so I just said the words. But that God and Jesus needed nothing more than simply that cry, that call from me. And he came in and I was as shocked as anybody. And he, you know, my life has been transformed and changed ever since. He's still my shepherd. And uh, I want to encourage you. He's just a breath away to becoming your personal shepherd. The Lord, I want you to be able to say with me, the Lord is my shepherd. The other thing is, he will give us everything that we need. The Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. Now, having everything we need can mean so much to so many different people. I've been uh, shopping online. Now, if you want to get to B&Q, you have to get in a Ironically, you have to get in a queue online to get into the B&Q website. You have to B and Q. <laughs> so, yeah. And uh, so, but yeah, I got in eventually after an hour. And uh, then they, uh, I put my compost that I desperately needed for the garden into the basket. And then it said it hadn't got any or I couldn't have any or whatever. So I was very upset and I needed my compost. Well, you might say, no, you didn't need it, Bruce. And they, you're right. But what do we mean? Because need means something so subjective to so, subjective to so many of us, to all of us. Well, how can we apply this? And I know, I know what I mean when I say I have everything I need. It's only when I analyse it, I think, well, what do I actually mean? Well, let's think of it. Maybe there is that part of us, that needing part of us, that we project on various items and things in life that we say, we need this, we need that. Some things are desperately more important than others, I know. But basically we're projecting or we're uh, expressing a, a deep part of us, let's call it that need gap or that need hole, uh, and it's being used in various ways. Well, let's look at it this way. Jesus fills that part of us and satisfies. Regardless of what we project it on, he is the one that satisfies that emotion, that feeling, that deep primal uh, part of our being that needs. And so we can say, regardless of what our needs are, we have everything that we need because he's filled that gap already. Uh, the, the older version says, I, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I will not want. And maybe that's a good term to use. So what we're saying is, look, I'm not going to allow my wanting of a thing uh, to uh, have precedence over the fact that Jesus has met my need, my all my needs, that needing part of me. It will not trump it, you know, because... Jesus fully satisfies. Now, I, I've spoken on this many times. My last sermon was about God uh, being revealed and known at the point of our need. It's, it's, a, it's that place of need where we, we find that God is fully revealed. Uh, and that's a wonderful thing. That's a wonderful thing. We don't have to be anything other than what we are with our variety of desperate things. And he's there and revealed and known in them, not in the good things, not in us being, you know, fully sorted, man, but actually just where we are. And so these two things are a good starter. The Lord is my shepherd. Is he your shepherd? He can be right now. And uh, he satisfies our every need. Amen. He makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside quiet waters and refreshes my soul. David will have written this when he was a shepherd boy and uh, like a wise young fella, he um, interpreted his circumstances and applied them to his relationship with God and wrote a psalm, which is lovely, which we have today. Now this morning at 11 o'clock, we had our minute silence. Uh, on behalf of those who tragically lost their lives sacrificially uh, working for the NHS. 
And prior to it happening, Carol said it, well, you know, reminded me 20 minutes before or so. And I said, well, well, actually, I, I didn't realize it was official, but I said, well, I'm pretty silent anyway. I don't say much nowadays. And she said, no, but this is a different silence. I said, oh, right. And so when we were silent, of course, it was very palpable. I felt myself welling up and I'm sure many people cried and felt all sorts of emotions and feelings about what, what's happening at this present time. And of course, we realize afresh that silence has so many different interpretations. We can have a cold silence. We can have an embarrassing silence. And I know plenty of those. <laughs> and, um, and so we also have being silent with God and being still with God. Be still and know that I'm God. And of course, this is a meaningful silence again. For some of us, it, it involves being quiet, literally sitting in a chair, turning off all our mobile devices and what have you, and being still for a while. Although that might not be exactly what I'm meaning, because in spite of doing those things, we can still be very busy inside. And our brains can be working 10 to the dozen as they normally do. So for me, it's something more than that. It's, it's dropping, as it were, our thoughts and leaving our thoughts behind for a bit and dropping down into our hearts where we've said that Jesus comes into our hearts, where Christ dwells in our hearts through faith. And it's about, it's an intentional thing. It's consenting to God's presence and God's action inside ourselves. Now, this is different from, say, something like mindfulness, which is purely about, uh, you know, trying to sort our lives out or trying to find a bit of peace in the chaos, et cetera, et cetera, which is a great thing. But it's not it, it's not what this is about. This is about a relationship with God. It's about surrendering to his love. Because indeed, this is how God works. It says he leads us beside the still waters. He doesn't force us to go, but he calls us with his love. And in fact, all of creation operates on this basis through the overture of God's love. God isn't forcing things to happen so much as things are responding to the overture of God's love. At least that's how I see it. And that's how I see he works in our lives. And you may say, well, hang on a minute, it does say he makes me to lie down in green pastures. Yes, but that mustn't be taken too literally because God doesn't force us to do that any more than I would force a sheep to lie down in the grass. I would merely say, hold it, folks, we're not going any further today. And then, of course, the sheep would start lying down. And in that sense, I would have made them lie down in green pastures. And maybe at this present time, this is what God is doing. He's pressing the pause button and he's saying, hold it, folks. He says, it's time to stop. And it's time for us to consider where we're going and why we're doing what we're doing. It's a time for us, especially as Christians, to seek our hearts and surrender them afresh to the purposes and actions of God in our lives. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. This is verse 3. And we'll be looking at this word righteousness at first. And for me, there's an ambivalence there. I do love the word. It's in the Bible. You'll see it in the letters of the Bible. You'll see it in the Old Testament and also in the Gospels. It's all over the Bible. It's a word that because of that, I have great respect for. But if you went into the streets and you did a word association test for the word righteous, you'd get a mixed response, I think. And I think a lot of people would say, well, it smacks to me of aloofness, uh, um, inapproachableness, uh, self-righteousness. I may be wrong. Maybe some people might say that it also speaks of uprightness and being a pillar in the community or something like that. But definitely the word righteousness would need unpacking. And 
I'm going to just unpack it a little bit by going back into verse 1 and 2 and just seeing the context there of what righteousness could mean. So in verse 1 it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. Um, this It talks about the state of righteousness, that we are uh, the shepherds and the shepherd is our shepherd and the rest of it. And we are complete in Jesus, as Paul says. Um, he that spared not his son but gave him up for us all how shall he not with him freely give us all things we are complete in jesus we're in a, we're in a right state and then if we looked at the second verse we could pull out the idea of experience the experience of righteousness that unity with god that union with god and we talked about the consent of the will to the presence and purpose of god within and so these two things emphasize the um, the state of righteousness and the experience of righteousness. And then the word righteousness, what could it actually mean? Um, well, uh, Jesus said, I mean, we would probably first thing we would say, well, it's keeping the law, isn't it? Uh, and the, but Jesus did say, and the Apostle Paul said twice, these words that uh, the whole law is summed up in love the Lord your God with all your heart soul mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself so it's summed up in the word love and so we would we would be able to work out that it would be selflessness and self uh, not serving ourselves but serving others and serving God uh, and the antithesis would be a selfishness or serving ourselves and uh, when I was a young Christian people would say that the central letter of the word sin is I and the cross is the I crossed out very clever stuff and then others would say that uh, uh, the word flesh in the Pauline epistles in Paul's epistles um, would refer to the self-life because flesh is self written backwards with an H and it's self on the throne and so and it, also there's this thing um that uh, gk chesterton once said when he, in the newspaper there was an ad saying uh, what's wrong with the world and gk Ch chesterton wrote back dear sir i am your sincerely gk chesterton so we all intuitively know and instinctively know that this uh, antithesis uh, to righteousness is this self on the throne or selfishness or self-centeredness and we would be forgiven for thinking that uh, given those first two verses that the Lord is my shepherd I have everything I want uh, and that he makes me to lie down uh, and uh, beside the still waters etc etc that we've cracked it surely that's the answer uh, to this self on the throne surely the self is subdued but I would say no it isn't not necessarily and in fact in my own experience it isn't either there can be incredible complacency in uh, in being complete in Jesus that your salvation is all about you isn't it and all about me my Jesus my saviour uh, my uh, my um, fulfillment I have everything I need and it can have so it can subtly become quite selfish that I'm all right, Jack. Um, all that matters is that I'm safe. And uh, we go out, we, we put this thing on. Is, is it to keep me safe or is it to keep others safe? It's quite a little challenge there. And then the experience, our experience can become so self-centered that we're grasping for more and more for ourselves. And it's like I've said in the past, spiritual materialism, where in the material world we grasp for what we can get. And it's that same spirit of grasping, but we apply it in a spiritual way. And so self is very much on the throne, although because of the spiritual context, we don't see it. And that's what makes it more dangerous and more subtle. And there needs to be more. Well, what is it that... And, and verse 3 to me is the answer to that. Um, it's, we, we, we have it all in theory. We have it all set up, as it were, in experience. But it has to be put into practice. 
And so this third piece is a very important part of the puzzle. I've been really into the jigsaw puzzles. And this is a, the key part. Without this bit, the other two just, we become stagnated. I mean, the sheep, they weren't supposed to eat all day. Uh, or, or to lie still all day beside the still waters. They needed exercise. They needed to get out. And so Jesus is uh, saying, or should I say, the good shepherd guides his sheep in the path of righteousness. And I love how David has put this for his name's sake. He'd be a good lad in, in, a, in a, to have in your youth group. He really got it sorted. Not about us. It's about him. And so we go out. And we serve others in Jesus' name. And that, to me, and for all the books that are written, the spiritual books of achieving, you know, this wonderful experience of God, or, you know, the great theological expositions upon what it means to be justified by faith, when all that's, none of these things are sufficient, if we don't simply go out there and love people, <laughs> a little child can understand it. And that's the, that's the great thing about the gospel. And so we're called to do that. We're called to serve. We're called to uh, subdue self by serving others in his name or, or being servants in his name. Because I know how hard it is for all of us at this time. And for some of us, uh, you, you, you're with people all the time now. You had space, but you don't seem to have it now. And it's incredibly demanding um, uh, for, for you to, um, to, to be of service to others, full stop. Some of you hopefully are finding it easy, but not everybody. And we need to support one another and pray for one another and know that the Lord understands. He's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He's not some he's not some pushy dude in the sky, but he's the good shepherd that guides us and leads us, and he will do so. For others, it's frustrating. Uh, it's really frustrating, isn't it? Because you 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 want to be with others, you want to serve others. You've been great at this, and now you can't do it because you're isolated. Well. You must pray and find ways that you can. And, you know, sometimes the creative things that we're finding to do in the home can be ways of expressing our servanthood to God. But there are other small ways perhaps we can reach out to others. I mean, we've had a small card from the church. It's been lovely. Just saying we miss you uh, and you're on our hearts. And it didn't take much to do, but there was great love and it meant a lot to us. And so these three aspects here are so complete together and so lacking without one another. And they're not really, you can't really separate them out. They're all part and parcel of the holistic experience of Jesus Christ as a Christian, that we have him as our shepherd and we're complete in him, that we, uh, we consent our wills to his present and purpose in our lives from our heart and we know that place where we can do it of communion but we also in the third thing is that we have to go out and put it into practice it has to be implemented application has to be uh, there uh, and so that is really I shouldn't really have any more time I've spent my time on just the first three verses I'm going to stop there but I hope to continue uh, in um, the rest of it maybe do the odd video uh, maybe I might try and get them done this week and uh, then I'll let Ross do what he wants with them. Uh, but remember, the Lord is your shepherd and he will guide you. He will provide for you in every way. And we'll all get through this together and we'll be stronger for it. Our faith should be stronger, to be stretched and to be stronger. And we will know the Lord in a deeper way. So God bless you this week. He really will be with you and we're all behind you and we're all behind one another to support one another in prayer and in the furtherance of his love. Amen. Friends at Burniston Methodist Church have been reflecting on the purpose and meaning of prayer and have formulated an eight-week plan they're calling Strategic Prayer. It's where we're seeking wisdom and guidance for our everyday lives, all to the glory of God. This is week one, 
and we're going to be focusing on the theme of vision, involving how we see God's will for our lives, seeing how we should be, how we should live each day, seeking God's plan for the church and the future. Proverbs 29 verse 18 says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. So in the next few minutes, I shall pray on your behalf to have a vision for God's will, God's wisdom, direction and purpose. So let us pray. Dear Lord, we all see in different ways, and yet what we see affects our understanding, our actions and our lives. As we seek to improve our vision and enhance our very own understanding, O oh Lord, help us recognise your will, even in the little daily events of our lives. Help us see what blesses us, what warms your heart, Lord, what is part of your plan for our lives? Give us the wisdom, dear Lord, to realise that your wisdom is far, far greater than ours and that when we're puzzled and life seems to be at odds with our choices, help us see that in your wisdom you may be trying to teach us something new and lead us closer to you. Help us discern your direction for our lives, if only a step at a time rather than the entire journey. Give us the wisdom to heed your nudges in our lives and follow where you lead even when the path may not be clear. And Lord, help us slowly recognise your purpose, not only for our lives but for the church, even though initially it may involve only planting a seed in your precious hands and in your time it may yield 30 60 or even a hundredfold so lord we offer you our prayers our hopes and dreams our faulty vision our openness and our commitment knowing that seeking to do things for your great glory is what ultimately brings us that inner joy one of the fruits of your spirit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And now I want us to pray for others, especially in our troubled world. Let's continue to pray. Loving God, we thank and praise you for who you are, your watchfulness over us, your guarding and guiding. We're blessed by the glimpses of peace and beauty in your colourful creation. We're grateful for your wisdom and patience, seeking only the best for us, yet allowing us the freedom to choose. And choose we do, often preferring to ignore you, Lord, and go our own way, ending in a mess. We're sorry. Lord, we come today bringing all the mess with us, coming just as we are, and asking for your help through our prayers for others and for ourselves. And as we remember the theme for today, the 23rd Psalm, we pray first for those who wandered away from you, for those whose faith has become a struggle, an overgrown path, a dangerous precipice and we pray for those who've left faith far behind. O oh Lord, help them notice those inner promptings, urging them to turn again to you, finding you already there, searching and following, ready to carry them safely home. We pray too for those who are lost, afraid, bruised by what life has thrown at them, for the sick, the dying, the bereaved, for those facing abuse and fear, for those facing loss of income, redundancy, a failed business. O oh Lord, strengthen all those who reach out to help, 
buttress all organisations and volunteers to help in new creative ways. And Lord, we pray, stay especially close in the darkness to those who need you most. But also, Lord, we pray for those in third world countries who face not only the present pandemic, but also facing starvation and malaria. O oh Lord, help us to pray for them in a meaningful way and offer what we can to help finance key world aid agencies. Grant stamina and courage to all working on those international front lines. But then we also remember the image of God, the Good Shepherd, and pray for those facing enormous risks to help rescue and save others. So we pray for all NHS workers and those working beyond, in care homes, in community, in whatever way. Bless and multiply those precious safety resources, Lord, that all workers might be kept safe. We pray for those and the families who've already paid the ultimate price. We praise you for reminding us that this present valley of darkness will not last forever, that healing and wholeness will come, and we pray a vaccine too in time. Grant us patience, Lord, as frustrations tend to rise and despair surfaces. But we pray too, Lord, for those who in this present crisis have found hope in you, discovering for themselves Christ's saving love as he carries them home, rejoicing, ready to celebrate. Bless their hearts, Lord, and send the right Christian nurture their way. And may the church be ready to welcome them when our buildings reopen. So finally, I pray for you, whoever you are, wherever you are, and whatever you need. I pray that you will continue to recognise the Christ within you and the Christ by your side. May his spirit continue to enliven you and keep you going. Keep well, keep safe, and may God bless you. Amen.